Welcome to The Rock. We hope what you watch today inspires you. And we'd love to hear your questions and comments via Twitter at The Rock of York. You can also find us on Facebook or contact us through the website at www.rockofyork.co.uk. In the meantime, let's crack on. I want to talk to you about purpose tonight uh, and about having an edge. Um, we, we, have, we have declared 2016 a year of hope and uh, have done some talking about that and everything that's been um, said is connected with that and linked with that. I thought the last two Saturday nights were outstanding, um, really tremendous. And um, so I want to continue tonight just to talk a little bit about, about, about hope and purpose and having an edge. Um, hope is, uh, purpose is actually the cousin of hope. Because if you don't have any sense of purpose, I will guarantee you, you're not going to have much hope. Because purpose is the cousin of hope. So unless we find a sense of purpose in our lives, uh, actually the chance of, of embracing hope, the whole concept that the last word has not yet been spoken, you're probably not going to get there. See, the issue is that sometimes we know what we're doing, but we've forgotten why we're doing it. And when we've forgotten why we're doing it, we've lost our purpose. And when we lose our purpose, we lose our hope. So I want to talk to you tonight about the importance of re-establishing purpose in your life. Purpose, the definition is the reason for which something is done or created or for which something exists. It's the reason, okay? We all need a reason. Um, I've, been, I've been a follower of Jesus for a long time. I kind of stumbled into it uh, a little bit as I guess it was a grace on my life because um, I never knew anything else but to be a follower of Jesus. My, my parents, I love them dearly, were followers of Jesus. And uh, they, you know, some, people, some people's kids are like put off what they would call religion for life because of that experience. It was the opposite with me. I saw such a a genuineness in their faith that it wasn't, it wasn't something that they just did. It wasn't somewhere where they went. Uh, it, there was a why to it. There was a purpose to it. And so I kind of stumbled on this gig in that way for which I am um, very grateful. Um, but in the context of that, um, uh, it, it's because there is a reason. When there's no reason for something that's done or created, that's when we lose our purpose. Um, as, as being in this thing a long time as well, I've met a lot of people who um, have, again, stumbled one way or another into becoming followers of Jesus. Um, if you don't like that phrase, then, well, deal with it. Um, because that kind of was what happened. Disciples on a beach stumbled on becoming followers of Jesus. This guy turns up, follow me, and it's kind of, you know, Matthew wrote the book of Matthew, tax collector. Jesus comes along. He kind of stumbles into this gig and follows Jesus. And I kind of like that because it means, it means that any one of us from any background, uh, of any previous experience, raised one way or not one way or another, can kind of stumble into this thing. And I think times like this are a little bit about that potential to stumble into this business of becoming a follower of Jesus. Um, the thing is, when you become strong in purpose, everything has more power. So I've got kind of quite a few little statements I'm kicking out tonight to deal with. One of the reasons we feel powerless is because we have become purposeless. The stronger the purpose, the more power you experience in your physical body. How many of you know when you've got a sense of purpose, you can go harder and you can go longer and you can go better? When you don't have a sense of purpose, you're tired before you even start. Isn't that true? So, so when you become strong in purpose, everything, everything in your life has more power. Your brain power, your thinking power, your debating power, your questioning power. Everything has more power when you become strong in purpose. So, so let me throw this out right now. If, if you mentally, emotionally, physically are lacking in power, I know why. It's because you're lacking in purpose. So if we can get the purpose back, we get the power back. Now, this is very biblical. I could give you a lot of verses on it, but I'm not going to stretch it too far. 
Um, also, your provision in life is attached to your purpose in life. Wonderful verse in Matthew 6, verse 33 in Jesus' Sermon on the Mount. He said, if you seek first, well, he said, he said, you guys are running after this and running after that and you're worried, where's my next meal coming from? You know, where's my wages going to be, be, be raised? You know, what clothes am I going to be able to get? Jesus said, if you run after all these things, he said, you need to know this. If you will seek first the kingdom of God, right? That's not a religious statement, that's about a real kingdom. Ki kingdoms are not created by churches or religions. Kingdoms are created by kings. And kings are kings because they rule. So when Jesus said, seek first the kingdom of God, he wasn't meaning becoming more religious. He was saying, if you'll understand there is a king who rules a kingdom and kings have power in that kingdom, if you'll seek the kingdom of God... Um, and his righteousness, which again, if you come from the wrong side of the tracks, means that you've got to try to be righteous. But he said, if you'll look for a righteousness that's given, rather than a righteousness that's earned, seek first the kingdom and the righteousness that's given. He said, all these things will be added unto you. Or in other words, the provision follows the purpose. Now, again, I'm going to say, if you're lacking in provision, I've got a solution for you. If you catch the purpose... Jesus said the provision will follow the purpose. Now, of course, that, that's scary because we like to think we have to know what we have to decide what we're going to do. But Jesus said, decide what you're going to do and then you'll have what you need. Now, that's why I told you what I told you earlier about how we operate as a house. We have decided what we are going to do, and we've always found when we decide what we're going to do, we have what we need because provision follows purpose, okay? Boy, you're learning some stuff tonight. If you'd actually take this on board, it's going to bring some change. Okay, so purpose is to the human spirit what water is to the body. Now, what happens to your body if you don't drink water? You very quickly begin to deteriorate and lose strength. And, of course, strange things happen, like you begin to hallucinate you begin to see things, imagine things. You get weaker and weaker until after not a very long time, you will die physically if you don't drink water. Now, I'm serious about this. Purpose is to the human spirit what water is to the body. If your spirit doesn't have purpose, it dies. You become dead on the inside. You become unfeeling. You become unable to assess and evaluate. One of the things when, when, when you are without water is that you're unable to make sound decisions because you can't, your brain won't properly evaluate what's going on. When you are bereft of purpose, your spirit can't evaluate what's going on on the inside, what you need to be a whole person because, because purpose is to your spirit what water is to the body. It's essential. It's not optional. It's absolutely essential. Now, purpose is about the why in your life and the why of your life, not the where or the when. See, purpose is not about where should I be and when should I be there because some of you are here tonight because this is where you should be and when you should be here. And then you'll go away and think, what was all that about? Well, it wasn't my fault. Because purpose is not about the where and the when. Purpose is about the why. What you need to say is how do I rediscover the why I'm there as opposed to where I should be and when I should be there. It will revolutionize your existence. These are good lessons about purpose. Now, let me say something on this. If your why does not extend beyond yourself, you will be consumed with issues of the present and the past Unable to embrace a hope and a future. Let me say that again, it's important. If your why does not extend beyond yourself, because for some of you, the only thing that exists in life is you and your need. Now, one of the things I know about being a follower of Jesus, Jesus wanted us to find our identity from the Father because the beginning of Jesus' successful ministry, he heard the Father say, you're my son, 
I love you. I'm pleased with you. I haven't done anything. I haven't done a miracle. I haven't preached a sermon. But the father says, you're my son. I love you. I'm pleased with you. And it says he began his ministry from that point. So, so the key is, if you know who you are, you'll know what to do. And when you know who you are and know what to do, there is a sense of purpose in those two things that are linked together. But you see, if we are so self-absorbed and self-obsessed, what do I mean by that? How many of you have ever said, why me? Why is this happening? Put those two together. Why is this happening to me? That's called being self-obsessed, okay? The only thing we're aware of is ourselves, our own little circumstance and what is happening to us. Now, now you're entitled to be that and you're entitled to do that. I am not trying to minimize the challenges and the issues of our lives. I'm not trying to dismiss what the past has served up for us. But what I'm trying to get to you is that if the why of your life doesn't extend beyond yourself, when you're consumed with those issues of the past and the present, you are unable to embrace hope and the future. So the very thing you want, you can't get. Because what you're doing is counteracting it. Because your why is only, why me? There's something bigger beyond to help you and deliver you and set you free. Now, another statement. Until your why becomes a why not, you have not moved from static belief into a dynamic faith. Until your why becomes a why not, you haven't moved from, sta from, from static belief into a dynamic faith. Some of you need to start looking not at the past and not at the present, but you need to get some hope in the future and say, why not? Why not? Okay? Now, that doesn't make it happen, but remember what we said, that provision follows purpose, not the other way around. So if you're looking for all the why me's and the why does this always happen to me and why this and why that in your life, if you're looking to that, no provision can follow because there's no purpose for it to follow. But when you start looking with a hope and a future and say, you know, this is the definition of hope, the last word has not yet been spoken, right? Which means those are words for the future. They're not hopes about fixing the past. They're hopes about preparing a future. If the last word has not yet been spoken, we're working towards those words in our lives. And the truth is, when we have that sense in our lives of that happening, it becomes a why not? So in your life, with all your challenges, everything that's happening with your family, your kids, and all that stuff, how about you change from why? to looking and saying, the last word's not yet been spoken. Why not? Why shouldn't I have provision? Why, why shouldn't this become something great? Why shouldn't this be a doorway of opportunity rather than a prison cell? Why shouldn't this be a beginning rather than an ending? Why shouldn't this be a resurrection rather than a death? Why not? See? And that's where purpose begins to change our lives. Now, very quickly, the process of purpose has an opposite, it's called the process of task, okay? I'm gonna quickly show you this, we've, we've talked all messages about this, but I'll just give you how it works, okay? Here's the process, purpose, it should be up there, it's coming. Purpose produces passion, which produces joy, which produces release. Now, all of us want release in our lives. We want release in our mind, our spirit. We want release from stuff like guilt and fear and obsessions and all those things. But you see, there's a process that works, and it begins with purpose, okay? And when you grab the purpose, the why, that makes you say, why not, it produces a passion, a passion for life. And passion brings strength and energy and focus, and togetherness, it makes it that no obstacle can stop you in your way. Passion overcomes obstacles. But then passion produces joy. Because when we know that passionately we've got a purpose, it brings joy in our lives, and then that's what brings us to the place of release. Now, where many of us live is on the other side of that fence, because there is another process that is task. The opposite to purpose is task. If you came here tonight to fulfill a task, right, the task being, 
I belong to The Rock, and it meets at 6.45 on Saturdays, so it's my task to be there. You are not here because of passion, you're here because of duty. And let me tell you what happens then. Resentment. The resentment that I have to be there and give up a Saturday evening for I don't know what, because you've now lost the purpose. And then the resentment leads to judgment that says, it's your fault. I'm coming because of you, therefore, somehow it all becomes my fault and Chris's fault. I've never, you know, after 30 years in ministry, I've never figured out how it's all my fault or all her fault. Well, it's because of this, because when task is the driving factor, here because I have to, duty is what is manifest and resentment comes because of that duty and we finish up in judgments, okay? And then we leave. I want you in that top one. I want you purposed, passioned, in joy, with release, because that's what changes our lives and it's what changes the world. Now, I have to say as well, there's a little funny, little paradoxical thing about this, because some people's purpose has become the defense of their weakness and lack of self-worth, which they produce with great passion and have a strange, weird and inverted joy that releases them to stay as they are. That's the paradox. So don't be one of those. Don't say my purpose is to be passionate about defending my weakness and lack of self-worth. Give it up. Stop it. It's not helping you, okay? And if it's making you happy, it's not making the rest of us happy, okay? So I want to talk to you then about the next part of this. Ecclesiastes, which is not a, a book to uh, particularly, you know, ease your troubled mind at bedtime. Um, our, our former dog who's now deceased and in the great doggy kennels in the sky, um, one day I came home, I'd left my Bible on the table and the Bible was open at the book of Ecclesiastes and the dog had eaten half of Ecclesiastes. <laughs> and she found, she found a box of Rennies on the table So she also ate half the box of Rennies. So even the dog couldn't handle Ecclesiastes without without some form of antacid. But there is some good stuff in there. There's some quite funny stuff in there as well, which we haven't time to talk about. But, But this, I think, is a great verse. Ecclesiastes 10, verse 10. It's easy to remember. 10, 10, okay? If the axe is dull and its edge unsharpened, More strength is needed, but skill or wisdom will bring success. Now, we're going to use this verse just as a picture, as an analogy of purpose. Let's call the axe our sense of purpose, okay? So where the axe is dull and its edge unsharpened, more strength is needed, but skill will bring success. This is a wonderful picture of how life should work when we have some wisdom and we understand the skill that we can exert through that. But it poses the question, have I become dull, surrounded by dull people, doing dull things? And the answer to that is, of course, nobody dare answer it. Unless we've got purpose that brings passion, the answer is yes, 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 yes. It's dull, and it produces dull people who do dull things. Now, I've decided I don't want a group of people, I'm not even going to call it a church because we are the church, I don't want a group of people where I'm dull and you become dull and we just do dull things, okay? It's a year of hope and it's time to look at some stuff and say, why not? So, keep your axe sharp. A dull axe, you know, a dull means blunt, okay? It means blunt. A dull or a blunt axe is dangerous for a number of reasons. But perhaps the biggest reason is that a dull axe can bounce off the surface of wood, especially if swung at an angle, and then glance off and potentially hurt somebody, even you. Right? A sharp axe will typically bite into the wood, protecting you from this happening. Here's my problem. If we're walking around without purpose, if we have a dull axe, we are dangerous for a number of reasons. 
because it can bounce off whatever it is that we're trying to do and hurt somebody, potentially you, even worse, me, or the person sat next to you. You can hurt somebody when you have a dull axe. When you don't have purpose, you can hurt somebody when you're swinging at life. Because your swing at life is bouncing off and smacking people in the head and doing all kinds of weird things, kneecapping them. Because you don't have purpose. You see, we were meant to have purpose in life. But as I said, that water purpose is to the human spirit as water is to the body. So this, the, the purpose that we have has to be sharp. It can't be dull. It can't be blunt. Okay? So I've got five things about when the axe is dull or you, and you have lost your edge. Okay, here's five things that happen when the axe is dull and you've lost your edge, and I want to link these to purpose. Number one, the work rate increases, the effectiveness decreases. So you do more for less return. You have to exert yourself because your edge is blunt. It's not cutting anything. It's not going anywhere. There's no purpose in it. When there's no purpose, the work rate increases, the effectiveness decreases. Now, whether that's you're working on yourself or working on your family and your relationships or working on your spirituality, if you're dull, if your purpose is not sharp, you work harder for decreased effectiveness. Number two. The appearance of success increases proportionate to the level of activity, not the appearance of success, but the real legacy is a weary, disillusioned worker. Or in other words, we appear to have increasing success because we're working harder and doing more and running around more and getting involved in more stuff. But actually, all that's happening is we're becoming more weary and disillusioned because we weren't sharp. The purpose wasn't sharp. We're trying to work ourselves through the thing rather than purpose ourselves through the thing. Number three. The tree's resistance to the axe never changes. A tree is a tree is a tree. But the dullness of the axe creates the impression of resistance by the tree. So as your purpose gets duller and duller, less and less, more blunt and more blunt, you think, flipping heck, this problem's getting worse. This situation's getting more difficult. This person's becoming more resistant. No, they're not. If you're using an axe to cut down a tree and it stopped cutting into the tree, the tree didn't start getting harder. It's telling you your axe just got more dull. You, you've lost your edge, right? So if that's our purpose in life, we have to be aware that as we put in effort and as we put in endeavor, it's not that the problem is getting greater, it's that we are losing purpose and we're losing focus and we're becoming more blunt. We've lost our edge as a person, okay? Number four, you can tell the sharpness of the edge by the sound it makes when it meets the wood. Now, this is interesting. I should have really had a blunt axe and a sharp axe, but I haven't. There's a couple of videos on YouTube that you can watch, but if you listen to a blunt axe hitting wood, it's, it's almost like a drummer hitting a drum with a blunt stick. It makes a dong, dong, dong. But when you have a sharp axe and go into the wood, it makes a totally different sound. And when you're the one using the axe, you can tell whether the axe is sharp just by the sound it's creating from what it is that you are doing, okay? So if you're kind of hearing stuff coming back at you that don't sound right, it could be your edge that's missing, okay? Because when the edge is there, there's a good sound, okay? And you'll know it, you'll learn it, okay? Number five, get this one, this is so important. You will never restore the edge without friction. This is the bit we don't like. But it's true, you cannot sharpen an axe without friction. Friction creates heat, friction creates sparks, but friction also sharpens the iron. But you see, we have an aversion to friction, because we think all friction is against me, 
All friction means I'm not loved. All friction means there's an attempt to destroy me, rather than understanding that actually friction is the very thing that sharpens our edge. The confrontation of friction sharpens our edge. What happens when we go, ouch, and get away from it, all that happens is, yeah, we don't have the heat and we don't have the sparks, but nor do we have an edge. So we carry on with our blunt edge, trying to live blunt with our purpose and probably become very blunt with people and get ourselves into trouble because we don't realize that friction creates an edge, okay? Challenge is good. So, I've got a little statement. Our reason for teaching and being is to sharpen your axe, to give you an edge so that you can effectively tackle the issues facing you and those around you in life to aid you to live in the favor that God has proclaimed over your life, free from condemnation, guilt, and shame, and to be part of a never-ending, expanding, peaceable kingdom as a follower of the Jesus who showed us what God looks like so you can show others the same. You want me to say it again? I'll say it one more time. Our reason for teaching and being is to sharpen your axe. That's why I'm here tonight. To give you an edge so that you can effectively tackle the issues facing you and those around you in, in life. To aid you to live in the favor that God has proclaimed over your life. Free from condemnation, guilt and shame and to be part of a never-ending, expanding, peaceable kingdom as a follower of the Jesus who showed us what God looks like so you can show others the same. And that's it. That's all I got to say about that. So I bless you. And pray that the friction on your life will produce the edge in your life that you'll come back from task to purpose and that as you recover the purpose, you'll find yourself in the most wonderful place of release. Because you realize that that's what was missing tonight. But you made a decision, never again. Never blunt again. Right? Never purposeless again. Not driven by task. I'm looking for the purpose that brings the passion. That produces in me joy that brings me to complete release so I can be part of this peaceable kingdom. So Father, you're with us. Help us, help every one of us to find this, to be it, and for our lives to take off in a wonderful way as we manifest your kingdom. In Jesus' name, amen. We're done. Thanks for watching. You can find out more about all the rock is doing locally and internationally at www.rockofyork.co.uk. And why not support the rock from wherever you are? Just hit the donate button now to help us help others.